Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for waiting around till the, the bitter end to hear from me. I really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Edmund Jackson. I work at a company called HCA. Uh, we like to think of ourselves, some of us do anyway, as uh, Nashville's largest startup. We were founded in 1968 here in Nashville, and we've grown to uh, be the owner-operator of about 170 hospitals uh, across America. My role in the company is the chief data scientist. And so the mission of the company is the care and the improvement of human life. And we do that through everything that we do. And hence my mission and the mission of my team is to use data for the care and the improvement of human life. And so what I wanted to do here was share some of the thinking that underlines that. I don't want to talk about products that we, talk, we, that we build or partnerships or you know, any kind of a brag sheet. I want to say, why are we doing this? How do we think about this? And let's take it forwards. OK. so. Let's start with, with some models. In my, in my last honest role, before I became a manager, I was a computer programmer. And there you wrangle with complexity all day long. And I realized I was taught that you can think of complexity in two ways. There's intrinsic complexity, which is how hard is a problem. And there's incidental complexity, which is how much complexity have you imposed on yourself by how you've chosen to solve it. Now, this is important because complexity is the enemy. That's the bottom line of this entire talk. We need to understand complexity. We need to combat complexity. And to do so, we need to understand it. And this is the first step towards understanding it. So now that I'm a, a manager, I have to have two by two grids. And here's one. And so on the bottom left, you have low intrinsic complexity, a problem that's intrinsically pretty simple, and low incidental complexity, you're solving it in an easy way. So we call that walking the dog. It's a simple problem. It's kind of boring. Don't waste your time. Moving to the right, we have hard problems that have been solved in a simple way. These are elegant problems. You're very lucky if you find yourself in such a space. They're rare. Top left are simple problems that have been solved in a complex way. You've made your life harder than it needs to be by how you've chosen to solve the problem. We call those Byzantine problems. There was no need to build those churches to look that way, but we did anyway, so Byzantine problems. The top right is where most of us live. It's hard problems that by their nature have forced us to solve them in a difficult way. And the core of, of uh, commerce and industry is to move things out of there. So let's have some examples of how things project into the space. Boarding a flight. This used to be easy. Like 30 years ago, you went to the airport, you showed your ticket, you got on the airplane. We as a society have decided to make it more complex to get onto an airplane now. So you show your ticket, you jump on a pogo stick, you undress mostly. Better or worse, it's now much harder to solve the same problem. Fundamentally, the intrinsic complexity of getting onto an airplane hasn't changed. But the incidental complexity, the ceremony that we put around it, has increased dramatically. Contemporaneously, we're trying to elect a president right now. A few years ago, this wasn't so hard. Now, there's a circus of pollsters and talking heads. And I, I, as a foreigner to America, it's very entertaining for a while, but it's a bit overwhelming. But at the end of the day, we're solving the same problem. At the end of November, after the election, we will have elected a president. 80 years ago, it was pretty much the same. We elected a president. The same complex problem, the same intrinsic complexity applies, but we've done it in a much more complicated way, for better or worse. On a more serious note, let's talk about presenting, preventing infectious diseases. Here's a place where, a few years ago, we were in an elegant space. Through vaccines and immunization, we create herd immunity so that we're able to prevent infectious, deadly diseases in a very elegant way. However, in some places, we're moving away from that. And so rather than having a herd immunity, an elegant solution, we now may be forced to have point-wise healthcare interactions with people. We're trying to solve the same problem, preventing our children from dying from diseases, but we're doing it in a more complex way. An example going in the other way from, you know, uh, right to left illustrates a different dynamic in this space. Transport. So cast your mind back a couple of hundred years. Moving from A to B was difficult. Moving goods from A to B was even more difficult. Moving lots of people or goods was basically impossible. Now it's pretty easy. There are services that allow it. You just do it on your cell phone, basically. And so there are dynamics that move things in this space. Up down, you've got process. If you want to make something more complicated, find yourself a committee. They'll help you. If you want to make something simpler, that's harder. And a good place to look is businessmen, companies, entrepreneurs. They've applied a whole range of tools to make it possible to do things, to make it inexpensive to do things, and therefore to gather larger and larger audiences and customer bases. 
And the, the key tools that they use for this in, are composition and abstraction. Now, we'll give some more examples, but composition is meaning taking simple things and putting them together, and abstraction is rendering that whole easier to deal with in the sum of the parts. And by building systems that way, we can simplify them. And I'm going to give a few examples. Moving left to right in the space is much harder. That requires science. You have to fundamentally understand the problem better for its intrinsic complexity to be diminished. And that's beyond the remit of most of us in this room, so I'm not going to talk about it. The reason this is important is that the total complexity is directly related to the cost, difficulty, and time of getting a given problem solved. So as you move to the top right here, things become more complex in totality. Their intrinsic and incidental complexity increases. So in the bottom left, you have problems that are simple. So you can automate them. You can get a machine to do it. You can get a basic computer program to do it. In the middle, in that manual section, you've got things where they're sufficiently complex and sort of one-off or ad hoc -y that you need a, a human brain to absorb the problem and to react intelligently to it. And in the top right, you have your moonshots. These are things that are so expensive, so difficult, requiring such an exertion of willpower that they're done as one-offs, literally things like the moonshot. OK, so so much for the theory. How does that actually work in practice? How are we doing this? And I'm going to get to healthcare at some point, I promise. So let's talk about composition and abstraction and as an example. If we start at the bottom, you have manufacturers. They've got goods. So be they yellow duckies or Bugattis, whatever they are, they make stuff. And the problem that they have is to move them from the factory to the marketplace. And so you can compose them by bringing them all together, and you can abstract them by putting them in a box. And the abstraction is now simpler than the sum of the parts. Rather than having a pile of yellow ducks, you've got a box of standard size and shape and with weight limits. And that allows you to not care what's inside the box. You've simplified your world. You can, and there's a line now. There's a level of abstraction between the box and its contents. So you don't have to think about the contents. You think just about the box. And then you can layer another layer of abstraction on top of that. You can say, OK, well, now I have these standardized boxes, so I can have standardized ships that go through standardized canals. I can have standardized uh, trucks to put them on and move them around. And so you build layer and layer and layer. And the notion here is these tight levels of abstraction. They don't leak. When I'm on the boat, I don't care if it's red boxes or blue boxes. I don't care what's in them. They're replaceable. And the boxes, if they were animate, don't care what boat they're on, as long as they get from A to B. And this allows us to take things down to bite-sized chunks and solve them, make them simpler, make them cheaper, and hence profit from the activity. So drawing a cartoon, it's kind of like a fractal. You've got your little spot at the bottom. You put them in a box as a triangle. That's now simpler than three spots. You then take that triangle and put it in a triangle. That's simpler than three triangles. And you keep going all the way up. And this is how you build global systems. But there's a problem. This guy, this thing, this creature, doesn't have layers of abstraction. He's not replaceable. There are no interchangeable bits. If you take the heart and replace it with a pancreas, bad things happen. There are no layers of abstraction that are independent from one another. If you disrupt uh, one of the physical systems, the others react. The layers of organization are not independent. So if you change something biochemically, you get a physical macro change as well. Change the insulin or change the, the cholesterol, the organism as a whole changes, even though that was a microscopic level change. And vice versa. Stop exercising and your biochemistry changes. So all the ways that we have of thinking about and simplifying and hence making possible stuff doesn't apply to this creature. So we have a problem because that is the center of healthcare. We're trying to think about and understand the human. But it gets worse. Hospitals, too, have a similar problem. Let's talk about replaceability, you know? The boats, you could replace the boxes, you could replace the boats. In a hospital, the, the same notion doesn't apply. If you have a, an operating theater and you change one patient out for another, it doesn't work. Change one doctor out or the surgeon out for another, it doesn't work. Change the drugs that the patient's on, bad things happen. So this idea of replaceability doesn't work. Moreover, the layers are not abstracted and separated from one another. We have places in hospitals which can form abstractions, things like the ER or the OR, MedSurg, PACU, but they affect each other deeply. If you get, you know, I don't know, all the, the staff missing on a MedSurg unit, that's going to cause your ORs to back up because you can't discharge patients. It's going to cause the ER to back up because, again, you can't move patients. So then you have to send patients to another hospital, so it affects not just your hospital, but the healthcare system. The whole thing is intrinsically connected. And so 
it's complex. The total complexity is huge. Um, and so healthcare, in the best and the worst sense of the world, word, is in the zone of miracles in the top right there. It is through heroic superhuman efforts of nurses, doctors, and caregivers that we're able to provide healthcare. They have to wrangle this complexity, this interconnectedness, this lack of replaceability every day on 12-hour shifts. The problem is that's quite expensive. And as our healthcare demands increase, it becomes difficult as a society to justify that. So we as healthcare providers are compelled morally and from a business sense to try to solve that. And there is potential that data can help us. This is the model of using uh, abstraction and composition to simplify so that you can move from the top right where things are complex down to where things are simpler and cheaper. We've discussed it doesn't apply to both the human as well as hospital or healthcare systems. So what is a, an equivalent cartoon for those? I'd argue it's something like this. It's an abstraction without a composition. So we've taken elements, be they humans or uh, doctors, nurses, patients, hospitals, whatever it needs to be, and we've represented them. But what's different to what's happened before is that there's no sort of geometric structure, there's no grouping and aggregation. You have to represent each element in the problem pretty completely. So each spot here might be a human, and you have to list elements about it, and you have to understand the connections between it. Human beings, we can't hold that in our brains. We can't think about it. We can think about this. That's clear and obvious. This is too much. And moreover, it changes. And so the difficulty that we have is that as humans, we can't do it. We need computers. We need data. Data enables this. And because of it, we can move things in the space of complexity and make possible what was previously impossible and make inexpensive what was previously expensive. So let's take an example. Um, Moving from left to right in time here. On the very far left, you have a page from the, the Book of Kells. It's uh, the Gospel of St. John, written by Irish monks in the Middle Ages at monumental cost over decades. It's the national, well, not the, but a national treasure of Ireland. As a consumer product, it's valueless because there's only one of it. It can be consumed by one person and one space at a time. It's what happens before your organizing principles of abstraction, composition, and automation. When those were brought in through things like the printing press and standardized processes that exist in newspaper presses, you could move to the next evolution, which is the newspaper. It's the same thing. We're passing news from point A to point B. The artifact is totally different, though, because rather than being one item at one place at one time, you have the same item distributed. So the same version of the Times lands on my doorstep as on your doorstep every day, reliably. And that's what traditional thinking has enabled for us. The problem is, or the limitation, is that the copy is identical. My, news, my times is the same as your times. The revolution occurring with data in the information or the newspaper industry is mass customization. The idea that we can produce a newspaper, an electronic newspaper, for people, and it's distinct for them. By going here, these companies, be they Facebook or Flipbook or Twitter, are able to see, OK, Let's represent and consider each of these spots to be a human or a news article. The lines are who shared something with somebody else, who liked something. The groupings are by topic, say. And so we can represent fully, not an aggregate, fully the articles and the people. And because of that, new things become possible. If Edmund, who is you know, age 36 and lives in Nashville, likes this thing, and John, who is similar, also likes this thing, and he's read an article and Edmund hasn't, well, perhaps we can recommend it. And that's how technologies like this are possible. So although it's, it's a theoretical picture, it enables things. And it's how many new products are being launched and, simple, and existing products are being simplified. What does it mean for healthcare? Well, we're still on the very far left here because we're in the land of miracles, the custom interaction. Every patient, when they come into a healthcare setting, is unique. I mean, it, it goes without saying. The genetics are, the diff are, are, are unique. The epigenetics are, are unique, the family history, the drug regimen, the complaint, everything is different. And so you can't standardize it, you can't aggregate it. Moreover, the care provider is unique as well. Depending on their experience, they can solve or not solve certain problems or solve things more or less effectively. And so there's no way to, to mass produce this. You can't automate it. The organizing principle, as we've discussed, doesn't apply. 
And so we're in this world where we're solving problems and we're working miraculously hard, but we're unable to you know, compete with other industries in terms of the cost reduction. So what can we do? I argue data may allow us to do it. What does the far right-hand side look like? What's the equivalent of Flipbook in healthcare? And the good news is that there are many such applications. Think of one, uh, keeping in the space of recommenders. You know, when, when a patient is discharged from our hospital, we want to ensure that they land in a place, a post-discharge setting, be that at home or a nursing care facility or a rehab facility that's most appropriate, where they're going to heal most quickly. We do this currently manually because each patient is different, each nursing home is different. And so we have case managers, care coordinators, an army of humans that, through heroic effort, place our patients in the right discharge setting. But this problem feels a lot like the newspaper recommendation problem, right? Because you've got people, they have ca attributes. What's their height, weight, age, comor morbidities, comorbidities, and they're on nursing homes. What's the quality of the nursing home? Do people who look like the patient I'm about to discharge do well in that setting or not? And so by projecting that into a space like this, we can make a recommender system and say, well, for these patients, this is the list of potential facilities. And that's just one potential example of how these things can apply in healthcare. And the point is, it decreases the total complexity of the problems we're trying to solve. The intrinsic complexity is the same. We're still trying to solve the same problem. But by organizing through data, we're able to solve it with an incidentally lower complexity, hence a lower cost. And as we move forwards in healthcare, this becomes more and more relevant. As with everything, there's a problem. And many of us have stated this problem during the course of today in that we require data liquidity. This representation here, that one, needs to be pretty complete in order for it to work. Currently, we still have a kind of old world way of thinking about things. Game of Thrones fans will recognize this. We solve our problem in our fortress, whether that is you know, uh, a drug compliance issue or a diabetes management issue or a care coordination issue. And we have solutions that work. And they are fortresses of solitude. There are little bridges that connect them and data flows a little bit, but it's not enough. And so efforts such as open data coming from the government, the Center for Medical uh, Interoperability, HIEs, APIs on applications, these are critical. I'll leave you with a challenge and a question, which is, what is the state of your data? Where are each of us in the room with respect to data liquidity? If you're a provider, what's your documentation like? What's your HIE like? Are you doing all you can to share, receive, and send data? If you're a startup, are you harboring data for fun and profit, or are you sharing for the greater good and the greater product that can be done later? If we're to move healthcare forwards, if we're to reduce cost, increase quality and outcomes, we need to solve this as an industry. And my challenge to you is join us. Let's do it. I know that in Nashville, there's the companies such as my own and many others. There's the capital and the expertise and the willpower to do it. I'm looking forward to you joining us on that mission. Thank you.